Um, I'm delighted to be here and to see uh, so many people, 123 uh, members and, uh, and friends are joining us. Um, I want to uh, introduce our, our speakers today, our presenters today, and to say a little bit about what they'll be talking about and also a little bit about what they won't be talking about. Uh, we have two presenters, two distinguished presenters. One is just Dr. Natasha DeJarnette, who's Deputy Director of Environmental Justice, Data and Evaluation at the White House. And the second is Dr. Rebecca Stanfield McCowan, who is Deputy Director for Environmental Justice at the White House Council on Environmental Quality uh, at the Office of Environmental Justice. So two very distinguished and important personages who are joining us today, and we're very appreciative of that. Now, I just want to say that we invited them um, some weeks or months ago because we were particularly eager to hear what the Biden administration has been doing regarding environmental justice. We already know and have much appreciated the work that's been done thus far and the funding that's been going, uh, been put out to communities, really the first time in US history, as far as I know, that environmental justice has been funded on anything like this level, uh, hardly at all has it been uh, focused on in the past. So this is a, a major uh, achievement and development and work for which we're all very uh, grateful. It is, however, not just a matter of gratitude, but a matter of justice. These are communities who have been the most severely acted and who need to be the most supported during a time of climate change. Uh, we, When we asked uh, the two speakers to come, we wanted them to not just tell us about what the White House and the Biden administration has been doing up to this point, but to tell us something about their plans for the future. Um, we made the mistake of speaking about, the, in the invitation, the next administration. And I think that got our speakers a little bit anxious because it seemed as if we were encroaching upon the political domain of the election. And they work at the White House, they are public servants, they're not involved in the campaign. So they can't speak directly to election promises, but they can tell us what's going on now and tell us more about what I think they expect will happen in the near future. Uh, you all, all the members, of course, are uh, and participants here, all the uh, guests and our friends, can, when the question times come, ask questions, any question you want about what's happening now or what you anticipate for the future uh, or what you hope for in the future. Uh, the people from the White House want very much to hear what you think, and uh, we are confident they will bring back your ideas and your suggestions and your concerns to the White House, and that, you know, Joe uh, and Kamala and others will listen to that, and they'll take into consideration as they move forward in their campaign and possibly into the next term. Um, so that's about all for that. The only thing else I'll say is that the speakers, I'm not sure what order they can up to them, which order they want to speak. Uh, I would say that they will speak probably about 10 minutes or so each. And that should leave us uh, 20 minutes to a half hour for uh, questions, because that's really the most important thing, that exchange between the participants here and the, and the speakers. So uh, without further ado, uh, may I turn it over to Dr. Natasha Dijmanet? Is that right? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. We are uh, deeply honored to be here. And I'm going to attempt to share slides now. I trust that you will let me know if you don't see slides. Looks good. Awesome. Thank you so much. So again, thank you for this great opportunity to be here. I'm Dr. Natasha D. Jarnett, and I am honored to work at the White House Council on Environmental Quality, also known as CEQ. And I am our Deputy Director for Environmental Justice, Data, and Evaluation. And I am also pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Stanfield McCown, Deputy Director for Environmental Justice, Public Engagement. And we are proud to serve in the Biden-Harris administration and honored to be a part of this team that is working to advance President Biden's environmental justice agenda, which is the most ambitious environmental justice agenda ever undertaken by the federal government. And like President Biden and people all over this country, we firmly believe that we all deserve clean air to breathe, safe water to drink, and healthy communities where we can live, learn, work, play, pray, and thrive. This is our why. Um, and we'd love to hear from you about what is your why? What brings you into this work and into this space? You are welcome to drop that into the chat and hopefully Harriet may be able to share out some highlights from that when we have our Q&A uh, in a few minutes. But with that, I am happy to turn it back over to my colleague, Dr. Rebecca. You have the floor. 
Thank you, Dr. Natasha. And um, I, as Dr. Natasha said, we appreciate this opportunity. I don't like to go into these with any assumptions of how familiar folks are with CEQ or our, our work. So I will be taking a moment to just lay some of the foundation as we talk about the, the work that we have been doing on the President's environmental justice agenda. Um, so first, a uh, little overview of CEQ and our team. For those of you who may not know, CEQ is chaired by Brenda Mallory and sits within the executive office of the president. And CEQ coordinates the federal government's efforts to improve, preserve, and protect America's public health and environment. So in both of our roles, Natasha and I support the first ever White House Office on Environmental Justice within CEQ, which is led by Dr. Jalon White Newsom, who I'm sure many of you know, who is the Federal Chief Environmental Justice Officer. And so we support this work to deliver on the Biden-Harris administration's historic vision of environmental justice for all. Slides are moving, excellent. Um, so on the EJ team, we have a couple of goals. Every day, we have the privilege of working to reduce pollution and other burdens and harms in communities with environmental justice concerns and other communities, help federal agencies deliver the benefits of the president's historic investments in climate, clean energy, water infrastructure, and other priorities to disadvantaged communities that have been marginalized by underinvestment and overburdened by pollution and to institutionalize and advance environmental justice across the federal government, really taking a whole of government approach to this work. This work is grounded in two executive orders, Executive Order 14008 that President Biden signed um, in his first week in office. So tackling the climate collapse, crisis at home and abroad. Um, so that established several new initiatives, including the Justice 40 initiative that I'll talk a little bit more about and the Environmental Justice Scorecard. This executive order also established the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. We might have some folks on the line from there um, known as the WEJAC which is composed of presidentially appointed environmental justice leaders that really that advise the chair of CEQ and the White House Environmental uh -huh. Justice Interagency Council on how to increase federal government's efforts to address current and historic environmental injustices. So it's through this order that President Biden also established the White House Environmental Justice Interagency Council. This is one of the ways that we really are looking at that whole of government approach. The Interagency Council includes the heads of our federal agencies and federal environmental justice officers, and they are rewiring the corners of government as part of our administration's all of government effort to advance environmental justice. The next executive order that really grounds our work that I hope you all are familiar with is 14096, revitalizing our nation's commitment to environmental justice for all. That was signed last April, a pretty historic um, EO for us. The order embeds environmental justice into the DNA of federal agencies. And under the president's leadership, the Biden-Harris administration is confronting longstanding environmental injustices and inequalities to make a positive difference in people's lives. Both of these orders are rooted in the belief of President Biden and Vice President Harris. And those of us at CEQ share that that every single person deserves to bring, breathe clean air, drink clean water, and live in a healthy community now and into the future, or getting back to that why that Dr. Natasha mentioned. So before diving into these key administration actions that our team is working to implement, I really just wanted to ground us in this executive order and the charges the entire federal government um, to do environmental justice work since this is important for framing how this administration is taking a whole of government approach for environmental justice. So it really is setting us up for what our tools and approaches for doing this work are. So in the executive order, the president, it contains important new charges to agencies to demonstrate leadership and take action. So we're talking about protecting overburdened com communities from pollution and environmental injustices through stronger actions from federal agencies, 
so that communities who have been marginalized and overburdened can receive the full protection of our nation's cornerstone environmental and civil rights laws. We're looking at confronting barriers to community participation in government decision making so that communities with environmental justice concerns know that their voices and values matter and to further embed environmental justice for all into the DNA of federal agencies so that we never return to a time when environmental justice was an afterthought or worse. It also recognizes that racism is a fundamental driver of environmental injustices that communities are struggling today and calls on agencies to identify barriers and take steps to end the latent harm related to industries and hybrids and communities. This new order fulfills the president's promise of putting the federal government on a new path for progress with the goal of ultimately achieving and securing environmental justice for all. The executive order also for the first time provided a whole of government definition for environmental justice. What's the Although order? some agencies like EPA have long demonstrated leadership on environmental justice in a number of ways, we've never had a whole of government definition before now. So we want to acknowledge um, the historic action of the EO that builds on and honors the work of community members and leaders from across the country who have devoted their lives to moving environmental justice to the heart of our national policy. Now, the work that we do as a team, what are we really focused on? What have we been focused on over the past three and a half years? What are we working on as we continue to move forward? So within the executive orders, we're working on the Justice 40 initiative that I know many of you are familiar with and we'll talk more about. We're working on the climate and economic justice screening tool um, that Dr. Natasha will talk more about. And we're working on the environmental justice part, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, I already talked about the White House Environmental Justice Interagency Council and the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, really important groups that are helping to guide this work. And then in our work across the federal government, we have the White House Campaign for Environmental Justice that is designed to connect communities with federal agencies and strategic planning to advance environmental justice. So each federal agency developing a strategic plan for EJ within their, within their agency. So I'm gonna jump into Justice 40 a little bit more. So the Justice 40 initiative um, is uh, President Biden's initiative that aims to deliver 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized by underinvestment and overburdened by pollution. So our work at CEQ is working to ensure that the benefits of the president's historic investments in America from clean energy pro projects to flood water protections reach communities that need them most. Um, the Justice 40 initiative really is based on a series of changes by agencies. It's not a one-time investment and it's not a single pot of money. It applies to existing programs and it applies to new programs that are created by the president's investing in America agenda. Um, programs in Justice 40 are um, included in the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and the American Rescue Plan. Um, I'm going to jump to the next slide. So you can access the list of Justice 40 programs. The White House has published a list of Inflation Reduction Act programs working to advance the Justice 40 initiative. There are 74 Inflation Reduction Act grant, rebate, loan, and other funding programs covered under Justice 40 that add up to over $118 billion in federal funding. Um, in November, the list of plans was updated. There are now um, 518 programs across 19 federal agencies that are being reimagined and transformed to maximize the benefits to disadvantaged communities. And I will say today, the president will be talking about a new program from the Department of Transportation that's looking at reconnecting communities that have been disconnected due to transportation infrastructure. So really excited about that opportunity for $3.3 billion that are gonna be going out to communities in 40 states across the country. 
So be on the lookout for those announcements. They're hitting the news this morning already. Jumping from Justice 40, we have the Environmental Justice Scorecard. So since day one, President Biden has elevated transparency and accountability as core principles of his environmental justice agenda. He has prioritized this agenda by advancing this historic whole of government approach. Um, this is why he's directed the creation of the Environmental Justice Scorecard. The first version that we call phase one of the EJ Scorecard was released the same day President Biden signed the Executive Order 14096 back in April, and it establishes a baseline for federal executive branch agencies so that over time, it will show how agencies' actions are making meaningful changes to protect communities and advance environmental justice. So at this time, it provides a really valuable snapshot of key work underway, highlighting important progress taken by agencies from 2021 through 2022. The scorecard covers three main categories of quantitative and qualitative metrics for the Justice 40 initiative, environmental and civil rights protections, and agencies' efforts to institutionalize environmental justice. If these categories of metrics are unfamiliar, the phase one scorecard website includes additional descriptions and information. The phase one scorecard development was positively impacted by recommendations provided by WeJack, as well as feedback from the public and some members of Congress. So again, another example of the important role that the WeJack and members of the public play in the, in the president's agenda. This slide shows a couple of the screenshots from both the landing page and the about page of the phase one scorecard if you haven't had a chance to go there and explore it yet. Um, it's available on ejscorecard.geoplatform.gov and you can reach it online if you search the term EJ scorecard. A major goal of the scorecard for us is to provide information that is highly accessible and usable to anyone and everyone. It is our hope that this tool for members of the public, such as students and community members, um, to help understand how federal government agencies are advancing environmental justice and where there are opportunities for more work to be done. So we really are encouraging folks to go to the platform, check out the information that's there, um, and, and provide us with feedback. The phase one scorecard uses federal agency data to advance the goals of transparency and agency accountability across the federal government as a start starting point for further evaluation and assessment of ways to achieve important long-term goals, environmental justice for all, and demonstrate the agency's progress in doing so. 24 agencies, so all of their logos are up here. I feel like sometimes we should play a guessing game if we can name all the logos. Um, provided quantitative and qualitative data to populate the phase one scorecard. To inform future versions of the scorecard, um, CEQ issued a request for information um, that has already gone out and closed, and we're using that opportunity to um, get public input into phase two um, and future versions of the scorecard. But you can also submit any questions that you have via email to the EJ scorecard hyphen support at omb.eop.gov, um, which is located at the bottom of this slide. And real quick, um, I had mentioned the, the WEJAC, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, a really critical component. Um, the Advisory Council shall be um, provides recommendations to the White House Environmental Justice Interagency Council, um, as well as CEQ. It was created to ensure that the insight and expertise of environmental justice leaders are heard and considered in the development of federal policy and decision making. And it's a federal advisory committee um, that was it's established to advise uh, the chair of CEQ, Brenda Mallory, and the IAC. So the members on the WEJAC were selected from across a wide range of backgrounds and have knowledge and expertise in environmental justice, climate change, disaster preparedness, racial inequality, among other areas. And so we really do look for them, look to them to provide us with recommendations and help inform the work that we do. When um, the WEJAC provides independent advice and recommendations to the chair of CEQ and IAC, um, we then respond, uh, providing a response to the WEJAC. 
so far, we've had 10 sets of recommendations from the WEJAC um, that we are, um, some have been responded to and some are in the process of responding to. The WEJAC convenes public meetings, which is a really critical component in allowing the public to provide a public comment to the WEJAC, which they then consider um, in their recommendations. And then to give you a sense of the, um, the IAC, our interagency council and the agencies that sit on the interagency council, this, as I said before, is really one of our key approaches to the whole of government approach that we have the agencies and their environmental justice officers weighing in and, and um, engaging with us, with the WEJAC um, and working through their agencies. One component that we are currently working on right now, it's really exciting to see progress being made, is strategic planning to advance environmental justice. So a key element of um, President's executive order was directing federal agencies to develop environmental justice strategic plans to help ensure they are prioritizing environmental justice and setting clear and meaningful objectives. At the end of October this past year, we released Strategic Planning to Advance Environmental Justice, a strategic plan template for agencies. This template serves as a playbook for federal agencies as they develop the environmental justice strategic plans that are due under Executive Order 14096. So this is really interim guidance for the executive order that was required by the order um, and CEQ requested recommendations from WEJAC, which will inform final guidance. In December of 2023, CEQ issued a charge to the WEJAC um, and we appreciate all the WEJAC members working to support the fulfillment of this charge um, on implementation of the executive order. So we're excited to be able to provide this template to federal agencies. You can find the template by going to um, whitehouse.gov slash EJ and looking on news and updates. You can scroll down to federal agency resources. We also have a blog where you can learn more about this new environmental justice playbook for federal agencies if you Google EJ playbook. Um, so that's one of the things that we are very excited about being able to work on with our federal agencies as we move through the spring. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Natasha to talk a little bit more now. Uh, thanks so much. Um, that that covered a lot and it's really refreshing um, and, and, and a moment of pride to hear all of the great progress. And so with that, just want to um, dig a little deeper into one of the tools that Dr. Rebecca introduced and that is the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. Um, version 1.0 of this tool is a key step in delivering on the administration's environmental justice commitments, including its Justice 40 goals. So I'm excited to share about this tool. Version 1.0 was launched in November of 2022, and federal agencies are using this tool to identify disadvantaged communities who benefit from the Justice 40 initiative. And version 1.0 responds to extensive feedback that we receive from during the beta version of this tool, including over 3,000 comments, emails, and survey responses, um, and much of which have been able to be incorporated into version 1.0. So for the CGIS methodology, communities are considered disadvantaged if they're in census tracts that meet the threshold for at least one of the tools categories of burden. In addition, communities are also considered disadvantaged if they're on the lands of federally recognized tribes. So really briefly covering the methodology and the tool, burdens are categorized according to areas that relate to both the Justice 40 areas of investment, as well as how President Biden describes disadvantaged communities in Executive Order 14008, which Dr. Rebecca described before. So those categories include climate change, energy, transportation, housing, legacy pollution, water and wastewater, health and workforce development. A community is highlighted as disadvantaged on the CGIS map if it's in census tracts that are at or above the threshold for one or more of the burden indicators, and if that tract is also at or above the threshold for an associated socioeconomic burden. Overall, there are a little over 27,000 census tracts that are identified as disadvantaged in version 1.0 of the CGIS. 
So I'll share an example of the methodology behind the climate change as well as the health uh, burden categories and encourage you to view the CGIS website under the data and methodology page to see the methodology along with documentation of the data sets for each burden category, which I will preview to you momentarily. But you can see them all summarized on this slide and the following slide. So for climate change, communities are identified as disadvantaged if they're in census tracts that are at or above the 90th percentile for expected building, agriculture, or population loss rate, or projected flood or wildfire, wildfire risk, and are also at or above the 65th percentile for low income. And then for health, communities are identified as disadvantaged if they're in tracts that are at or above the 90th percentile for asthma, diabetes, heart disease or low life expectancy and are at or above the 65th percentile for low income. In addition, a tract that is completely surrounded by disadvantaged communities and is at or above the 50th percentile for low income is also considered disadvantaged. So we discussed all the changes between the beta version and version 1.0 of the tool in the webinar that we hosted in November of 2022, the day that we launched version 1.0. You can find this video by simply Googling White House CGIS webinar, and it is also on the CGIS website under the public engagement page. So I'll share um, in the next two slides about the guidance and instructions that we provide to federal agencies on using the CGIS. So as of October of last year, agencies are using the CGIS for any new covered investments that fall under the Justice 40 interim guidance. So many agencies have already taken actions, including issuing notice of funding opportunities or NOFOs. And as these new covered investments are made or as new notice of funding opportunities are issued, agencies are using the CGIS to geographically identify disadvantaged communities to the maximum extent permitted by law. And the CGIS is now the primary tool used by agencies for such geographic identification. So these are the instructions uh, that are provided to agencies. And CEQ issued this joint guidance with the Office of Management and Budget and the Climate Policy Office for federal agencies on when to use the CGIS. And CEQ also in issued instructions for federal agencies on how to use the CGIS, and those are as follows. Um, federal agencies will use the CGIS to help identify disadvantaged communities, and agencies can either use the CGIS website directly or download the data on disadvantaged communities from the CGIS website, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, as discussed in the guidance, disadvantaged communities should not be defined by looking at just one category. The CGIS definition of disadvantaged communities is not designed to produce separate lists of categories of burden. Rather, agencies should use the entire list of disadvantaged communities identified by the CGIS as a starting point. Agencies may prioritize within the list of disadvantaged communities, and agencies may use their own data and metrics to prioritize certain communities within the set of disadvantaged communities. Yes, I hear a voice. Oh, you are mute, Stephen. You are mute. We're running a little low. Uh oh, Stephen, you're on. You're on mute, but I can see that you're speaking. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Sorry. Um, I'm saying that many of our communities are familiar with the EJ screening tool, and we're running a little bit short of time. So I wonder whether we could move right away into discussion and Q and A because I know many of our members are very eager to share their ideas and thoughts with you so you can convey them to your colleagues at the White House. Would that be okay? I, yes, if you don't mind, I will just uh, share just a little bit of helpful information for people to know um, how this is being used, where they may see it come in, and a screenshot opportunity for anyone that wants to be able to get in touch with us about the tool. And then I'm so, happy to turn it right back over to you or Harriet. Right. Awesome, thank you. So um, ways that you are you may see the CGIS in use, if you go to grants.gov, if you're looking to apply for grants or identify what grants are available, uh, we did a search um, late February and we saw that there were 70 posted or open opportunities that referenced the use of the CGIS along with the Justice 40 initiative. I'll just mention a couple from EPA, grant funding to address indoor air pollution at schools. This is closing pretty quickly, um, uh, March 19th. 
Uh, there's also the Environmental and Climate Justice Community Change Grants Program that's, a, that's closing in November of this year. And then the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants Program Implementation Grants that's closing in April of this year. So please visit grants.gov to find more opportunities. Here's your screenshot opportunity. Um, the guidance and instructions provide direction to agencies on how to use the CGES. They're publicly available on, this, on the CGES website, which is screeningtool.geoplatform.gov. Um, CEQ is uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. You're welcome to direct those questions to screeningtool-support at omb.eop.gov. We will forego the screening tool demo, but we want you to know about one other way to stay in touch with us please subscribe to our EJ Connector newsletter by emailing ej at ceq.eop.gov or capturing this QR code on the slide. This newsletter shares resources, information, and updates on environmental justice across the federal government, um, including updates from many of the agencies that have been discussed today. So thanks everyone for joining the presentation. We look forward to the Q&A and we hope that you'll get out the word about President Biden's historic climate and environmental justice agenda. Thank you. Um, uh, Harriet will now, I think, um, handle the Q&A. Is that right, Harriet? Yes, and I'm just trying to make sure that, um, have I got this right, add pin? So I'm hoping, there we are. Everybody can now see you properly, Rebecca uh, um, and Natasha. Wonderful. So if you have a question, can you um, use the the, go to the reactions and then put the hand up and then I can easily see you. Who's got questions? Actually, maybe I'll unpin because I think it's going to be easier. There we are, Susan. And I'll, I'll just jump in and say, I know that there's a chat function that some of you might be using. Dr. Natasha and I cannot see the chat function. So if there have been some dialogue or back and forth, we, we don't have access to that. Okay. Yeah. Susan. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Joe Biden and his group. Um, it's made so much difference. Uh, we have hopes now that we didn't have before, and we're seeing a lot going on. Um, but can you hurry? <laughs> um, I come from a small town that we've had several people drowned. Um, we're not a coastal town. I live in mid-Missouri in DeSoto. And people wash away due to flash flooding. Um, we're working hard on several different grants, but normal people like me can't fill out this paperwork. So thank God for A2 um, and Harriet. She's been a lifesaver to us. And um, as long as we keep people like her running things and helping us, we're good. But the rest of us, unless we're lawyers or doctors or something, we're lost. Um, no matter how hard we research and try. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, Daryl. You're on mute if you're saying. Okay, yeah. So I understand that a lot of the Justice 40 and federal infrastructure money is being, you know, downloaded to the state level. And so one of the concerns that we have is that if you're in a state that's red or purple, we're not too sure that this funding is going to make it to the community level. And so I understand that there's some guidance that you are giving the states. And like to your point earlier, the definition of what is the underserved community and you know things like that. But there's been a lot of conservative language that really is going against equity and diversity. So could you speak to how you're directing states to apply the, the guidance documents that you're sharing? Good question. Thank you, Daryl, for that question. That is a concern that we hear 
frequently as we're working with communities and with local city and county governments um, within a variety of states. And so we are working on our outreach to state governments to speak directly with state governments, um, working on our outreach to city um, governments as oh, well. Man. So they know their role in, in Justice 40 um, implementation and uh, building up technical assistance and capacity building. So both within community groups and individuals, but also at uh, local city, town, county government levels, as well as state government levels. So it's definitely a concern that we have heard from, from many, many different areas. And it's something that we are working on as we build the connections and relationships um, with folks uh, really spreading the word of Justice 40 and the variety of programs that are covered by it. So thank you for voicing that again. It's always good for us to uh, hear that again as we 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 know it, we feel it, and we're really working to try to um, support across the country the implementation of Justice 40. Thank you so much. It looks like there's a question in the chat. Uh, right. Oh, okay. Um, and Dr. Natasha, I don't know if you wanted to add anything or if not, we'll move on. Um. Oh no, Dr. Rebecca covered that um, very well. Thank you, and thank you for the for the question and for the comment, and, and thank you also to Susan for the inspiration to hurry up um, and and sharing about what your community is experiencing when it comes to flash flooding. Wonderful. Um, so I'll do a few more people on the screen, and then I'll I'll also look at chat after that. Um, Sky. Thank you so much, and I'll be as quick as I can. Um, yeah, I really appreciate your work, and thank you so much. It's an inspiring time to be doing this work, and it's great to um, <clears throat> read stories about all the wonderful environmental justice initiatives. And thank you so much to the administration for really centering um, environmental racism and the terrible impacts that that's had across the U.S. Um, I also want to thank the Biden administration for all your work on reproductive justice and protecting women's rights. Um, but I would like you to do more to connect those two issues more clearly in your work. Um, as you know, there's a huge amount of science that shows um, terrible impacts on pregnancy health from the climate crisis, but also the lead crisis, plastics, um, like basically name it because the fetus is so sensitive and the pregnant person um, in other ways too, um, the impacts are really um, significant and also have a lifelong impact on the person, uh, the pregnant person and, and, and the child. Um, but we're also seeing other impacts too, infertility in both male and female, um, fibroids, um, many other um, reproductive health impacts. And as you know very well, hitting the uh, black and indigenous um, communities much harder. Um, I've done a review together with a colleague and we found we, we didn't find a mention of reproductive justice in any of the executive orders, any of the statements that Brenda Mallory has made um, in the last three and a half years. Um, most of the plans that the um, uh, HHS, CDC, um, EPA, um, other agencies on how they're going to roll out climate change planning and ad adaptation as well as mitigation, no mention of reproductive justice, sometimes fetal impacts from heat and things are mentioned like that. But, you know, uh, it's always within the framework of the child's health as opposed to the health and the rights of the pregnant person to have a healthy baby. So basically I'll stop there because there's lots of grassroots, amazing people who I know you want to hear from, but please, please start connecting these two dots. It's a huge issue, massive health implications, mass massive rights implications. And we're in a maternal health crisis here in the US and we know that environmental health is part of that crisis but we're not seeing the policymakers and the leaders really join these dots. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Sky, for this comment. Um, very much appreciate um, the urgency uh, that you've added, um, highlighting the interconnectedness of these issues um, and, and the research that you've done um, around uh, our our public uh, statements uh, around this topic. So very much appreciate this. And I, I wanna say you you stand in a very strong company as well in our, uh, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council that Dr. Um, Rebecca discussed before, um, they issued recommendations 
recommendations to us regarding the climate and economic justice screening tool. And it was to um, continue to work with the Department of Health and Human Services to identify um, uh, maternal and child health metrics uh, for inclusion in the climate and economic justice screening tool. So you you stand in, in good company and very much appreciate the um, uh, the important comments that you've raised here. And it is uh, uh, certainly uh, something uh, that through that we are prioritizing. Thank you. Mark. Um. Hi, I'm Mark Favors with the Fountain Valley Clean Water Coalition. Uh, and I want to know when, you know, the in Congress right now, there's a big debate on extending RECA, the radiation exposure. And being that the U.S. military admitted to dumping toxic PFAS chemicals into my family's drinking water for decades in Colorado from Peterson Air Force Base, what, why hasn't the White House introduced anything or what are you doing? for environmental justice communities who, of course, cannot sue the DOD about getting justice for communities when the DOD admits actually purposely dumping uh, toxic chemicals into their drinking water. It seems like that uh, military communities that, that and military families that also are environmental justice seem to be left out. Thank you. Dr. Rebecca or Natasha? Um, thank you for that comment. I'm just going to say we can't comment on things that are in progress or legislation that is, is currently in progress, but I will say that through the President's uh, Investing in America agenda, um, we're delivering $50 billion so that communities across the country have clean water. Um, really looking at PFAS in drinking water is an issue. Um, we've already announced $10 billion for upgrading water infrastructure, replacing lead pipes, addressing PFAS contamination. Um, so working to ensure clean water, at least 49% of the funding um, from this is going to disadvantaged communities as grants in line with the Justice 40 program. So there are efforts that are currently out there and it's something that we are, are continuing to work on. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just take two that um, from the chat and then I'll go back to folks on the screen. Um, so for Michelle Smith, Community Empower and Development Inc. She says, are there any plans to create a more accurate view of disadvantaged communities in the CGS tool by using more granular data, such as census blocks instead of census tracts? Dr. Natasha, I'm speaking to you. Very much appreciate this question um, and, and uh, appreciate the attention to the opportunities to ground truth the CGS. Um, so, Something I'd like to share with you, and if you don't mind, I'll share screen for just a moment on ways uh, to provide feedback on the CGES tool, because we're always interested in hearing about people's experiences with the tool and hearing um, whether or not um, a certain community um, that you're very familiar with, if what is recorded in the tool matches the lived experience that is in that community. So um, in terms of data sources and, and any recommendations uh, for track level or um, or uh, black level or black group level, we recommend you to um, please, if you can see where I'm highlighting on the screen, that's a survey to share data sources with CEQ and you can make those types of recommendations there. Um, in terms of lived experience of a community, uh, I'm just clicking on a community right here. Once you click on a community, you can see the send feedback button. And if you have direct knowledge of this community and um, think that maybe um, what is shown here might not match the lived experience that you're aware of, then you can click on the send feedback button right here and provide additional insight that's specific to that census tract. Um, and we'll be able to see the exact census tract that you're discussing there. And then also, there's also the help improve the tool. So you're welcome to provide um, more general, more broad feedback here in this link as well. So there are three ways, um, there are three different links to provide um, additional specific information. I'm gonna stop sharing uh, on the tool. Of course, then you're also welcome to email us as we shared before. Um, the set, the, the CGIS methodology is built on census tract level data. I will 
point that out. Um, and what, what we have are nationally available data sets that are at the census tract level. And so the census tract level is about um, as, as narrow as we're able to get to have um, that meaningful community information um, with the types of data sets that we're using and the information that's presented in those data sets, um, a, the, uh, the, the highest resolution uh, that we're able to have consistently across the U.S. is at the census track level, but we definitely will welcome you to provide any feedback in the tool. We do read the surveys and we very much would appreciate that and, and, and appreciate this question as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, we are going to run out of time, I realize. One more on the chat and then I'll go back. Um, so from Queen Shabazz, how can community-based organizations that are boots on the ground serve as technical assistance advisors? I will take that one. Um, I would recommend connecting with the EPA's technical assistance. Um, they're Tic Tac, so they have technical assistance um, advisory centers um, throughout the country. They have regional ones and then um, connecting with groups. I'm sure many of you are a part of those already. That would be the place that I would start. Um, they are getting um, a lot of support for those centers and a and I think looking for those um, community connections. So if you Google the EPA Tic Tacs, um, that is where I would begin that process. Thank you. Um, Bobby. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you. Um, I just had some questions. It's uh, more like a follow-up question. Uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The gentleman mentioned um, having the money sent to uh, say red or purple states. Has there been anything implemented to ensure that the communities that need it the most will in fact get it? Um, I, th I don't think it's the community so much that needs uh, watching, but it's the uh, states. Um, if you have a task force, an EPA task force, or somebody from uh, the White House ensuring that what is actually being sent is being and is being sent and given to communities that need it the most. Franchise communities. So Bobby, you're breaking like up a little force? bit for me. Are you breaking up for other people? So I'm just missing yeah. a little bit of what you're saying. Yes, but I, mm -hmm. I, I think um, the gist of the question again is repeating a bit what we heard before, and that is that uh, red and purple states uh, don't seem to have a good track record of distributing the money down to the community level. Uh, what does the White House or any of the legislators or agencies uh, have as a strategy to prevent that from happening and to ensure that the money goes to where it's needed the most? So we are working with agencies on how they are tracking um, the, the investments of Justice 40. So the Justice 40 initiative is about more than just the money, it's about the benefits as well. So we are working on how, how those um, investments and benefits are being tracked with the agencies. And then the scorecard is another place where we're looking for um, as it gets built out in other phases for there to be a place where agencies can speak about the, the impact and the work that they're doing in communities. Thank you. Winifred. Um, thank you for doing this. And um, I'd like to uh, first um, support Sky's statement, uh, trying to tie maternal health also to um, the um, pollution. And um, even though here, um, the governor's wife, Tammy Murphy, is making it part of her campaign, it feels as if it's for uh, political expediency. And then also um, to thank the Biden administration for all this money. A lot of us here in the grassroots um, um, community, we're very excited about it, but it doesn't seem as if it trickles down to us. And we're afraid that we may never get another opportunity such as this. And is there a way to provide feedback? Because it feels sometimes as if those who do get the awards are more politically connected. And um, I 
also do agree with uh, Bobby's statement that maybe ensuring that what is being sent and given is not only for um, the communities, but the organizations as well, who have been fighting and who are more, um, I guess, vocal, because there is a difference between vocal and actually vocal. And um, so just to make sure that um, it's, I don't know, evaluated somehow so that um, the money doesn't go to um, the wrong hand, so to see, or the politically connected. Thank you. No, thank you, you for that feedback. And I'll say that these opportunities for us to connect with you in this forum are a great way for us to hear this feedback. Um, Natasha did have at the end of the slide deck um, an email that you can also reach out to us at our ej.ceq.eop.gov email address, which is a direct way to connect with the Environmental Justice Office at CEQ um, if, if there are other things that you would like to share. Thank you. Thank you. Gloria. Well, several of my um, colleagues have um, voiced what I'm about to voice. Um, when these monies come into, I, I'm in Escambia County, Florida. Um, and when these monies come in, the uh, powers to be uh, are hand selected by um, the powers to be, and they don't represent truly the communities that are being impacted. They're talking heads for the government, uh, for the developers, um, for landfill operators, for bad water. So how can we help um, and what is being done to vet these people that end up on these boards uh, and, and decide how our money is going to be spent um, and where it's going to go and the overhead and things of that nature. Because in my community, it's build, build, build. They don't care. Landfills, and I've done studies. Uh, my graduate students did a whole study, did two studies on the impact of landfills and the unborn baby. And that diesel fume, we all know, stays with that unborn baby forever. Um, and those are, you know, huge impacts, lead and Jackson, you know, and Flint, um, sewer overflows. And my environmental the city and the county's environmental directors are just kicking the can down the road. And they're the ones that are picked for these task force. How do we vet that and let y'all and EPA, I'm in district four, that continues to tell me that's a local problem uh, and, and does nothing. Um, how, how can we participate in that uh, to make sure the money's going in the right direction. Uh, I very much appreciate you raising this, uh, Gloria, and echoing, um, echoing and adding to the sentiments that have been raised by others. So we definitely um, will take this back to our team. Also recommend uh, the email address uh, that Dr. Rebecca shared before. And, and what I can share with you is that we are working closely with the Office of Management and Budget and supporting agencies um, uh, to be able to identify um, where the benefits uh, are landing. And so we will continue to work closely when we're um, uh, feel the urgency behind what you're saying and sharing this message in particular uh, back with, with our team um, in the executive office. Uh, and I, I, I apologize uh, for, for freezing in this moment, but definitely um, feeling your concerns uh, in this moment. So thank you. Thank you for sharing and, and we'll be happy to, to get that back to our team. Thank you. So I'm I'm sorry, Joyce, Lauren, and Carletta. We do we have run out of time, and we are going to have to move on. 
uh, Dr. Natasha and, and Dr. Rebecca, we are incredibly grateful for your time. We are, you know, should you ever need another forum, we have like every scenario of people impacted by the mining industry, the petrochemical industry, hazardous waste sites, mi the military, the flooding, the wildfire, drought, heat, you name it, they are represented among our members. Um, and so should you ever want to hear from people directly impacted, do, do think of us as a group to come through. As you, you heard, we have many people who are keen to share their experiences and voices with you. So thank you so much. And thank you everybody, our wonderful members and our members to be and our friends for joining this call and look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.